Um, but uh, so our, my talk is on mice today. And I've really structured this presentation as, oops, as an introduction to mycids as a group and something, you know, some um, things about their ecology and their biology. And sort of throughout my talk, I've um, woven in research from my lab or other uh, groups in the, uh, in the area that sort of apply. And so it's more of a, I'm trying to make this more of a narrative and less of a, here's an introduction, here's the research I do. And I'm trying to weave that together. I'm trying to be a bit more organic about it. I should ask before I move on, can you guys all see my screen, the um, title page? All good. All right, great. Okay, so first things first, with science, it really is a group effort. So before I show anything, any of the results that come, have come out of my lab, I have to acknowledge all the folks who have helped out. And these are just people who have helped out in my lab. There have been lots of other collaborators and other students from outside labs. But within my lab, I've had a number of graduate students that have contributed either time in the field of the lab or actually have focused on studying mice. It's, I've had help from a postdoc, Timo Arula from Estonia, as well as a bunch of really talented technicians and interns. And actually, um, this gent right here with the net in his hands, Joe Molina, he has joined us tonight. And he, um, he's gone on from my lab now as a graduate student himself uh, in West Virginia. So Joe's doing awesome. Okay, so what is a mycid? Well, as Bronwyn has pointed out, mycids, they're not true shrimp. They are, they belong to the class Malacostraca. So this, that class does include, um, you know, euphausids as well as the decapod shrimps and uh, really cool animals, the stomatopods. But mycids belong to the order Mycida. So this includes, this also includes amphipods and isopods and some other really cool animals. Um, so if we look on this, uh, this, uh, this figure here, we can see mycids in the upper left, and we see some other animals, some other malacostracans uh, down in the lower left, the euphausids and the stomatopods. So they look very similar to lots of these animals, but they, um, they are obviously different. And so what are some of those differences? Well, before we dump, jump into those differences, let's talk a little bit about their habitat. Where do we find mycids? Well, we find them across a range of salinities, anywhere from uh, freshwater habitats to full strength seawater habitats. They really do occur in aquatic systems around the world. Um, you know, we're gonna be focusing on Chesapeake Bay today. So I'm focused on mycids that occur uh, in saline habitats. In terms of depth, again, these animals, we can find them from um, very, very shallow habitats just next to shore, all the way out to deep offshore shelf areas, uh, more than almost more than 2,000 meters deep, so two kilometers deep. So these are very small crustaceans. In Chesapeake Bay, we've got a number of species that I'll talk about um, in a bit more detail. And you can see this is an image uh, of mycids that we collected in one of our net toes. That's all those little shiny things are individual mycids. You sort of end up with mycid soup in a sieve after you pull a lot of your nets. Um, but they are quite small. So adult length for many of the mycids in the bay is anywhere from 0.8 to one and a half centimeters. Um, maximum size you're going to see is around two centimeters. So, you know, not very big, but they are ubiquitous throughout the bay, um, all the way up from the, uh, the oligohaline areas, the very low salt areas near the head of the tide, um, all the way down to the mouth of the bay. So let's get into the anatomy of mycids. Um, so you can see here, this is sort of a very generalized cartoon image of a mycid. And some of the major characteristics um, are here. We can see they have stalked eyes. They do have a carapace. Um, they have their abdomen with abdominal segments. Underneath the abdominal segments are these, um, these sort of small appendages, these pleopods. Um, then we have the uropods and the endopods uh, that form the tail region. There's also a structure called the telson, which, um, which is pretty important that we'll talk about. They have swimming legs, which are similar to um, the, more, the more sort of classic um, true shrimps. But they also have this structure, the females do, called the marsupium. 
and this is where they will brood their young. And that's also, that's the reason why they're also known as uh, a possum shrimp, uh, because they, uh, they will carry and, and brood their young until they're ready to release the uh, free swimming juveniles. So there's some a few interesting structures I wanna draw your attention to with mycids. First of all, if we look near the tail, um, on this image, it points out this structure called a statocyst. So stat statocysts are, I um, actually have an image here. There are these fluid-filled vesicles, these pockets, and they're located in the endopods, um, these on one on each side of the tail here and here. And inside each statocyst is a small uh, circular structure, the statolith. So statoliths are small. Um, fluorite sort of accretions. Um, you think of them as little like um, hard rocks almost. If you're familiar with the otolith of, an, of a fish, the inner ear bone, it's uh, a similar structure. Here on the right, you can see some electron uh, microscope images of statoliths from different mycid species. So there's quite a variety of structures in the statoliths. And what these um, these actually form or perform a really important service for the mycids. They serve as a mechanism for maintaining balance and tracking inertia and direction when mycids are swimming in the water. Um, and that's and the way they do it is really cool. I don't wanna get into the details too much, but inside each of these statocysts, uh, there are small uh, sensory hairs um, all around the, uh, the outside of the organ. And as the mycid is moving through the water, um, or maintaining position in the water, these, the statolith is sort of pressing against these different sensory hairs. And depending on where and how hard the statolith is pressing against those sensory hairs, that helps the mice track where it is in the water column and how fast it's moving and things like that. So really important um, structures that are really, um, really kind of interesting in their own right. And it's also really neat because these statoliths, you can use them in some mice as a proxy for body size. So as the mycid gets bigger, these statoliths get larger and people have related uh, the diameter of the statoliths to the length of the mycid. So that could be useful for uh, paleoecological studies when they're um, looking at, you know, trying to figure out how big a mycid was or um, size structure. Uh, historically, they can use statoliths as a proxy sometimes. So going back to our cartoon of a mycid, um, this other structure that I want to talk about for a moment is the telson. And the telson is really important because we use it to differentiate species. Uh, I've got some images which I'll show you on the next slide. But before I do, I just want to I'll just hop back to the top here. Um, mycids are sexually dimorphic. It's a point I forgot to talk about earlier. Um, I pointed out that the females have a marsupium. But there are also other differences. Um, some species are sexually dimorphic in terms of size. So females are often larger than males. Um, but also there are other structures uh, that can be different between the sexes as well. Uh, and one structure, for example, um, that we use in my lab to differentiate male versus female um, mycids of the species Neomycis americana is we can look at the length of one of the pleopods and males, the, uh, the pleopods, I think it's the fourth pleopod is quite long relative to the rest of them. And so we can use the length of these other structures as an indicator of sex before, uh, for example, the females are mature enough to actually develop a marsupium. So lots of really cool um, differences between sex and um, structural differences that we can use uh, to study the species. So here, um, I promised you'll look at some telsins, and these are three different telsins from three different species of mycid. Uh, these were collected from Chesapeake Bay, and uh, Joe Molina, who's joined us today, he actually put together these images for me. And what you can see here at the top, we see a, an image of the, the individual mycid, and then to the right, we see the telson. And I wish I had sort of a, a blow up of where the telson is on the tail of the mycid. But if we look here in the middle at uh, sort of this middle panel of images, the telson is right here in the middle, sort of in the middle of the tail, right between the two um, statoliths uh, and the statocysts. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard, uh, almost paddle-like structure of the tail that's right in the middle. 
And, uh, and so you can see here, this is a telson from Americamyces bahia. Uh, it's an abundant species in Chesapeake Bay. And so what we often use um, are the number and shape and length of the spines at the tip of the telson. Uh, and they're, they're often quite distinctive uh, among species. So here we see the Americamyces bahia. Here we see another Americamyces species, um, Almira. Again, this is um, a common, uh, potentially less common, but still uh, occurs frequently enough in the bay. And we can see there's fewer spines, but they're thicker and more robust. And then down here at the bottom, this is um, probably the mycid species that I study the most uh, and, and folks in my group. And this is Neomyces americana. Uh, and right out here, if we look at the very tip of the telson on these guys, here's a, a blow up uh, image of what this looks like. And you can see these two very prominent almost uh, spines and almost look like fangs at the tip of the telson. So it's quite different than these other um, species that have these more rounded uh, structures. So, you know, mycids are really interesting. I, I'm gonna get to, the, get to where I talk about why they're important in food webs, but there's, they're interesting from the perspective that a lot of them have um, very strong movement behaviors. And one of the movement behaviors that's shared across lots of different species of mycids is this uh, a vertical migration in the water column. Uh, and we can see, this is a nice example of that, I feel. This is some acoustic backscatter data from an estuary, I believe it's in Maine. And what you see here is, um, you know, these, these are, this is backscatter data from uh, two different frequencies, 265 kilohertz and 420 kilohertz, um, but it's from the same days. And so we're basically looking at the same movements or same phenomenon in both of these panels. And what we're seeing is here in the middle of the night, um, this sort of increased um, density of the water. And what this is, is this is mycids near the bottom of the water column um, in the middle of the night. And then there's this sort of movement or dispersal up into the water column near the surface uh, at night. But then as we get closer to the morning, uh, the amount of sort of the light um, in, the, uh, in the environment increases as the sun rises. And we see all those mycids that were up in the water column move down to the bottom. And then they stay near the bottom until it starts to get dark again the next day. Again, there's this emergence uh, this sort of uh, movement around in the water column, and then the animals move back to the bottom. And so this, this daily cycle of moving into the water column and moving back down is very common uh, among different types of mycids. And it's very similar to a behavior called Diel vertical migration. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but that's a term that's often used to describe similar behavior in plankton. The difference is that um, there's lots of species of plankton that will sort of move en masse from being deep and then the whole group will move up to the surface or near the surface. And then for a while, then they'll move back down as a group. So mycids don't really appear to do that. It's more of what they do is they sort of, they're, they're deep and then they'll just broaden their distribution. Those deep sort of aggregations that form near the bottom during the day will just sort of break apart and disperse. And so you'll end up with mice that sort of disperse throughout the water column. Uh, and so this, there's lots of evidence of um, what we call partial dispers dispersal, where you know, some parts of the population appear to always move up, whereas others always stay down. Um, and there's other evidence from other populations that um, you know, it's almost like this rotational foray um, behavior where some will go up for a while, then come down. And while they're doing that, others will be moving up and coming down. And so what you end up with is a, a distribution in the water column, but really that's just reflecting this integrated movement uh, across the population. Many mycids also undergo horizontal migrations. And so this can include um, inshore, offshore movements uh, on daily or seasonal timescales. And then sort of more broadly, these larger seasonal migrations. So um, there's some evidence that we see seasonal movements into and out of estuaries, uh, I should say into and out of tributaries within Chesapeake Bay. And so there's this seasonal, uh, broad, large scale seasonal movements of the populations as well. And you know, if we think about it, 
Um, I'll sort of just tell you off the bat that even though we know mycids are really important in lots of different ecosystems, often we don't know much about them. And a lot of that is because of this sort of diel aggregation dispersal behavior. And if you think about it, typically what happens when we conduct scientific studies or surveys is that we'll go out with nets uh, during the daytime, pull them through the water, um, and then we'll sort of count and identify what we have in the nets. Well, as you can imagine from mice, it's, that doesn't really work, right? Um, during the daytime, they're either down near the bottom. Um, some of them actually go into the mud or stay on the, at the surface of the mud. And so a, met, a net passing through the water isn't going to sample them. Also, for those that remain in the water during the day, they form these dense aggregations, almost like a swarm of bees. And so, you know, if you happen, if your net happens to hit uh, an aggregation of mice, you're going to catch a lot, but the odds are your net is just going to miss them. And so it's really difficult to effectively sample mice during the day. And for that reason, there's often not a lot of data on mice from lots of different ecosystems. And this is just some data from my PhD, which I sort of collected on a whim, but it turned out it was really important. And so we were sampling off the coast of Maryland, off Assateague Island. Uh, in the ocean. And, you know, we were out there day and night sampling. So we did some net, net toes and we found in this, you know, during the daylight hours, this yellow bar for this plot here caught hardly any mice at all. And the few that I did see were um, down in the net, way down near the bottom. But then we started sampling at night and all of a sudden in both our nets uh, near the surface and at the bottom, we started catching mice, lots of them. And so it really speaks to this difficulty in sampling mycids unless you're specifically looking for them. And so that's probably the reason um, that we have very few focused studies in the Chesapeake Bay region on mycids, simply because sampling them is logistically difficult. So, you know, I'm, I've been talking your ear off already about mycids, but why, you know, why do we care really? So in these next, few slides, I'm gonna really try to make the point of why we care. Um, and I'm not gonna spend any time today talking about an invasive species beyond this one slide, but I wanted to include it just because I think it really drives home how powerful mycids can be in ecosystems. So this is a freshwater example from Flathead Lake, Montana, and it's a different species of mycid completely. It's uh, Mycids diluviana. Um, but this is a really compelling study because using um, lots of historical survey data from that lake, um, you know, some researchers put together a timeline for the, so the biological communities in the lake. And what they found, if we look down here in this bottom panel, this black line represents the abundance of this invasive species of mycid. And so in the mid to early 80s, the abundance took off. It peaked and then it sort of dropped down and bounced around at relatively stable levels. So it appeared in the ecosystem in the early 80s. Prior to that, um, if you look at these white bars, this is a kokanee, it's a salmonid um, related to you know, salmon or trout. Um, we see that those, those were quite abundant in the, uh, the lake. Also, we see that um, eagles, um, which fed on the kokanee, were also quite abundant um, predators uh, in that ecosystem. But as mycids took off and started to dominate and shift the plankton community, that changed the types of food that were available for the kokanee. And that led to a change in the fish community. And by changing the fish community, that led to a reduction in the amount of food available for eagles. And so eagles disappeared from the region as well. And so just because this mycid came in, changed the planktonic food web, that had these reverberations throughout the ecosystem, all the way to sort of what we call terrestrial connectivity or the, had the connections with terrestrial ecosystems with the change in the abundance of eagles. So really these mycids can, by occupying these low sort of intermediate trophic positions or these positions in the food chain, they have, can have a lot of um, almost outsized influence on how these ecosystems function. So I've talked to you about um, how difficult it is to sample mycids. So how do we actually do that? Well, um, I've told you 
plankton nets, the traditional net sampling gear doesn't work all that well. And it doesn't during the day, but it works really well at night. So we can go out at night um, uh, on different vessels and we can uh, use these more traditional methods to, uh, to sample mycids. We can also drag what are called epibenthic sleds along the bottom. And these are really useful for um, getting a net right next to bottom without hopefully getting it stuck in the mud. As you can see from this image here on the right, sometimes we do get our nets stuck in the mud. And that's sort of one of the uh, dangers of using nets in really muddy uh, sort of um, areas that are very uh, sort of um, get lots of organic matter deposited is lots of good food for mice, but lots of chances to gum up your gear like this. So beyond simply using traditional nets, there's um, some other really cool technology out there that I haven't used in depth, but I've explored with some collaborators. And so I'm gonna show you two of them. One of them is using a plankton scope. Uh, that you see a sort of a, a cartoon uh, schematic of it here, down here on the left. And these two sort of pods on the right and left hold um, a light emitting device and a light receiving device. And then as this is towed through the water, um, sort of shadows of animals in between this emitting and receiving device are captured in, in photographs. And you can see images here on the right. We were testing this gear, which is actually um, owned by Dr. Hong Sheng Bi. He's another um, fisheries oceanographer here at, at the Chesapeake Biological Lab. And you can see examples of mycids um, here in A, uh, B, C, and D from this technology. So it certainly works. The problem is, at least for me, is there's a lot of um, post-processing of these images that has to happen. Somebody's got to go through and look at all these images and find the ones that have mycids, and that can take a lot of time. There's automated method methods where you can train, uh, use machine learning and other techniques to train computer algorithms to recognize the shape of a mycid, but that takes a lot of time and sort of dedicated manpower, which you know I, I don't have in my lab. Another really neat option is using sonar. Uh, and there is one um, very high resolution uh, sonar system called the ARIS system. If you guys have ever heard the Didson sonar, it's similar to that. Um, but it's able to resolve uh, images down to, or items down to, I think like maybe half a centimeter. So it's really, really impressive. Um, and so I, I did have a project where we used the ARIS sonar. Um, I wasn't responsible for analyzing or really doing much with the data, but we used this technology in tandem with our, our net-based approaches. And um, this part of the project was really run by Dr. Katie Lank Lankowitz. She just got her PhD uh, earlier today. She defended her dissertation, so I get to call her doctor tonight. Um, but Katie is amazing. She's been staring at these um, sort of sonar images for a long time, and I'm going to show you a video clip now of what these look like. Before I do, I just want to orient you to um, this, this sort of image. And so at the very top of the screen, this is the surface of the water. And you can see that it's a shaped like a cone. And these numbers, one, two, three, four, that's depth in meters. So from the water surface or just below the surface of the water. And then this lit area, this is the bottom. And at, once I hit play, you're going to see the bottom moving. That's the ship moving across bottom. And you're going to see up in the water column um, uh, schools, aggregations of mice. This was taken uh, during the day. You're going to see this is only a, it's a really short clip, but you're going to see a big aggregation right here at the very start. So I just want to key you off to that. Uh, and then a few seconds in, we're going to start to see small lenses of mice aggregations down near the bottom. So I'm going to hit play. Here we go. This huge aggregation, that, though, that was a mycid aggregation. Those were not fish. Down here in the bottom, we can see a lens just past the mycids. There's another one, sort of these ephemeral structures coming off bottom. And what's kind of cool is we're going to go over a, swar a, a school of fish now. Here's a school of fish. And you can see the difference is that in that school of fish, you can sort of resolve individuals moving individually. You don't get that level of resolution with the mycids. 
what you end up with is just sort of these amorphous uh, group uh, uh, movements of these larger blobs. And that's how uh, we can differentiate between sort of individual fish swimming individually uh, versus these, um, these aggregations of mycids. So after doing um, some research in the Bay and reading through the historical accounts, it seems like there's at least six species that call uh, Chesapeake Bay home. Uh, these include America mysis almira, America mysis bahia, America mysis bigaloi, Metamycidopsis swiftii, Mycidopsis furca, and Neomycis americana. Uh, I do personally a lot of work with America mysis bahia and Neomycis americana. Anybody who is involved, oop, I just saw a question. Should I take a moment or should I? Um, Oh, it looks like uh, Bronwyn suggested we, we get to that question at the end, so I'm fine with that. Um, so I, I focus on these two species of mysis, America mysis uh, bahia and Neomycis americana. Folks might be familiar with the name America mysis bahia. It's, uh, it's actually used quite extensively by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, in their toxicology testing. So it's a really good toxicology, or I'm sorry, a toxicity um, study species. So you may have heard of, uh, heard of it from there. Uh, there you go. Okay, so what, what's the life history of mycids like? Well, it's very much species dependent. Um, most mycids have quite short lifespans on the order of less than a year. Um, you know, you can see up here in the upper right, this is uh, generalized mycid life cycle, but this is actually specifically for Americomyces bahia. Uh, again, from one of the EPA uh, sort of um, culturing documents. And as you can see here, after being released day one as an early juvenile, for this species, about day 20, um, they're ready to release their first brood. So they mature within about two weeks. So a very rapid lifestyle for this particular species of mycid. Um, particularly in culture. Uh, it's different uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in nature where we have seasonal temperature cycles. So marsupial development really is this key sort of unique trait uh, or somewhat unique trait of mice in life history. And within the marsupium, uh, embryos will go from, you know, these, these very early stage embryos that look very egg-like through this uh, nopleo nopleoid stage. Um, oops, I forgot an I here, a nopleoid. It should be nopleoid, not nopleod. Um, but anyway, it's uh, this sort of secondary stage where those eggs start to elongate and look almost teardrop shape. And then there's a metamorphosis to the post nopleoid stage still within the marsupium where we start to see um, individual uh, swimming appendages developing. We start to see the stalked eyes um, becoming apparent. And, um, and we're actually gonna see some of those images in just a minute. And then what's really cool is that when the young are released, they're released as free swimming juveniles that are, that look uh, almost identical to adults, just very much uh, smaller. So you can see some examples here in this lower image where we have you know, newly released juveniles all the way up through uh, mature adults. And so the frequency of reproduction really is species and region dependent. And I wanna take a minute to sort of show you guys some images from my lab um, that highlight or, or, or exactly show you what these different embryonic uh, development stages look like. So here we have a Neomyces americana in the upper right, and you can see it's marsupium. It's got a few um, these egg-like embryos in the marsupium. And if we break open the marsupium and sort of look at them under a microscope, they look very, um, you know, they're sort of irregularly spherical. They're not perfectly round, but, you know, you could be forgiven for saying they look just like an egg because they do to me. And you can see that um, we can measure them under the microscope and these have a diameter, you know, a little bit less than 400 uh, microns or 0.4 millimeters. This is the embryonic phase. Moving on to the nopleoid stage, this is that intermediate phase. So again, if we have a mycid um, with a full marsupium and we break that marsupium open, this is what our nopleoids look like. 
So they're these sort of elongate teardrop shaped um, organisms. You can see in this case, there's a few small structures starting to develop. Um, and we can see they've doubled, if not tripled in size at this point. So they've grown quite a bit and um, as, they're, as they're developing. And now the final phase of development in the marsupium is the post nopioid stage. And these guys are a little bit broken up. They're kind of in rough shape, but um, you can see here, they're starting to look much more, or at least take on some of the characteristics of the adults. They're developing the, uh, the eye stalks. They have um, the swimming appendages. They're starting to develop the segments of the abdomen. And so they're starting to look much, much more like uh, small adults. And we can see if we look at the length, these are now um, over a millimeter long. So 1.2 uh, to 1.3 millimeters in length. So these were all images of Neomyces americana uh, sampled from Chesapeake Bay. And you know, Neomyces americana, as well as other species of mycid, um, all, almost all of them, as far as I'm aware, individuals were reproduced multiple times. So they're what we call iteroparous. Um, but then, you know, there's multiple generations within most ecosystems. So there will be often an overwintering generation that was released as juveniles in the fall. Um, those individuals will sort of grow somewhat throughout the winter and then reproduce in the spring. But then because temperature, temperatures are so much higher in the spring and summer, um, those individuals will um, mature very quickly and then have be able to reproduce again in the spring and then again um, later in the summer. So we often get um, two or even three generations of um, mycids within a population. Hey, Ryan, we got a couple of questions here. Jillian wants to know how does the mother nourish the embryos in the marsupium? Sure, the, um, the embryos actually have their own yolk. So they've got their own yolk supply. Um, so all of the, um, sort of the nutrition from the mother comes during the development of the initial embryo. And then it's much like a um, sort of a, a chicken uh, in its egg, the, um, the baby chick using the yolk. And then Dallin has their hand up, so you can go ahead and unmute. Oh, sorry, I must have done that by accident. Dallin does not have the hand up. <laughs> no worries. And so, yeah, the, the, do you do you know how many um, offspring each one uh, produces in a? That's an excellent segue to uh, a slide that I have in a few slides. So um, I'm actually going to touch on that. That was a question that we we're very interested in in looking at. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm going to show you some of those data actually. And it looks like there's a question from Sarah as well. Is climate change affecting mycids? and are their life cycles changing? So that's an excellent question, Sarah. Um, I don't think that the sort of the biology of their life cycle is changing. I think that's pretty hardwired uh, genetically, but I think to your point, the timing and the um, maybe the fecundity or the number of offspring per, per female and sort of the size of those offspring at, at when they hatch or are released. All of those things are potentially affected by climate change or habitat degradation. And so it's a really good question and one that we're sort of trying to tackle a little bit. And you'll see that um, in some of my slides. All right, great. Great questions, guys. Thank you for, um, for raising your hand and jumping in. Okay, so I need to set the stage a little bit before I get to uh, Bronwyn's question about the number of progeny or young per female. And I'm going to preface sort of the rest of my talk with this, um, this sort of introduction to a couple of the tributaries in Chesapeake Bay that my group looks at quite intensely. And that's the Choptank River and the Patuxent River. And you can see them here in the map. Um, Baltimore is sort of up here um, quite a, a bit. 
But here, the Chesapeake Bay on the uh, western shore of the bay, I'm sorry, Chesapeake River, no, I'm sorry, the Tuxet River, here on the western shore of Chesapeake Bay, uh, and then over here, the Choptank River on the eastern shore near Cambridge. And these two tributaries are actually really nice study systems because they're similar in terms of the volume of the tributary. They're similar in terms of land use, although they're not identical, of course. Um, the chop tank is more agricultural, whereas the Patuxent tends to be more suburban. But neither one is super urbanized. Neither, neither one is highly, highly developed. And so they actually provide a good contrast uh, that we can use to look at how um, differences in local conditions might affect um, animals like mice. So specifically, the Patuxent River is deeper down here in the, uh, the middle to lower reaches of the basin. And because it's deeper, there's less, um, there's less mixing between the surface water and the bottom water. And that leads to hypoxia, where the bottom water can become stagnant. There's uh, a lot of um, bacterial respiration and decomposition. And this can use a lot of the oxygen in those deep waters. And so if we look at these oxygen profiles, which start up at the top, and then as you move down, we're going down in depth in the water all the way to the bottom. Here, some of these uh, stations and areas in Chesapeake Bay drop down below two milligrams per liter of uh, oxygen. And that threshold, that two milligrams per liter concentration is usually what we consider detrimental to aquatic life. So we turn that hypoxia. If we look at a similar plot over here on the right from the Chop Tank River, we can see that in all these instances, as you move down through the water column, even when you get down to 16 meters of water, 14 meters of water, we never get close to that two milligram per liter threshold. So these two systems are similar in a lot of ways, but they're different in the quality of that bottom water habitat. So a, one of the, a lot of the questions that my lab asks are focused around this idea of what are the effects, if any, of water quality on mycids in their ecology? And so this is actually getting to Bronwyn's question earlier. We have looked at the number of eggs or larvae present in a female, uh, female's marsupium. And we've looked um, for seasonal patterns. We've also compared uh, the different river systems and this analysis isn't quite done yet, but what we have found is that there's a clear difference in seasonality. So mycids that um, reproduce in the spring after that long overwintering period, they tend to have more eggs or larvae at a given body size than the mycids that um, sort of are released in the spring and then mature and um, bear their young in the summer. So there's this seasonal difference in the productivity of individual females. When we look between the two different river systems, it's less clear that there's a difference. Um, you can see from this image that if we fit um, sort of a, a line to these two different um, data from these two different rivers, they sort of cross in the middle. And there's not a clear pattern. Um, there is some evidence, I'll say, that if you look just in the spring or just in the fall and then compare the two rivers, it does look like there might be a difference with the chop tank possibly having higher fecundity at some body sizes, but we're still exploring that, um, those data. We're also really interested in growth rates. How quickly are mycids growing? And you can think about the quality of habitat and how a habitat that is better quality might support faster growth rates um, for these animals. And so what we do is we can measure the length of mycids and then look at how the sort of the average length changes through time. And that's kind of what you see here. This is called modal uh, length progression, where we have a, a mode or like a, a group of data, a group of animals that are a certain length. Then we go out a month later and all of a sudden these animals have grown and they're now a different length, but there's new animals uh, in the population. And so if we go out month after month after month, we can trace how quickly these animals are growing by looking at how these modes um, uh, of animals, these different cohorts are uh, changing in length. So when we do that and we compare juvenile growths 
and adult growths between the two river systems and um, across different seasons, what we see is kind of unsurprisingly, the juveniles grow faster than the adults. You know, that's, that's not super surprising, but it's important to document that. So we have these different um, growth rates for use in models. Um, and again, sort of some surprisingly, we didn't see a consistent difference between the two river systems. We didn't see clear evidence that animals in the chop tank where there's better water quality were growing any faster than animals from the Patuxent. So it's interesting that there doesn't appear to be a spatial difference there, at least not one that we can see. So then what are, the next obvious sort of question, right, is well, okay, they're, they're might not, they might be growing at the same rate, but what about patterns in abundance? Well, sort of the way all ecological data works is you go out one year and you see a super great pattern. You go out the next year and the pattern just falls apart. Um, so that's kind of what happened to us. We, we sampled in 2018 and 2019. And in 2018, if we look at these blue bars, they're all in the, that's the Chop Tank River. Mycids were always more abundant than these red bars in the Patuxent River. And so whether you're looking at total mycids or you're looking at the juvenile life stages, except for here, August, in this case, the chop tank consistently had more abundant, was more abundant in terms of mycids. But in 2019, we went out again and there was no real difference between the two systems. So, you know, it's not clear exactly whether or not the chop tank is supporting more, more mycids, even though it appears to have better water quality. We think it's probably the case long term. There's some sort of historical survey data that supports the chop tank having more mycids. But the two years that we looked, it was somewhat inconsistent. It was interesting, though, that we, we saw changes in the mycid community, changes in the assemblage structure. So this is a really sort of simplified way to look at that. But the way to interpret this is, um, these dark bars represent the proportion or percent of mycids that's Neomyces americana. The light bars represent the proportion that um, belong to the genus Americomyces. And so starting out in the spring in both the tux and the chop tank, we had complete domination by Neomyces. But then as we move towards the late summer and early fall, we see a transition, a shift in the community structure. So it looks like there's seasonal turnover in the mycid species that are in these tributaries. And this is probably linked to seasonal migration into and out of these tributaries um, at different sort of, um, with different seasonal timings. Okay, I realize I am talking a lot more than I expected to. So I'm gonna try and go a little bit faster. I don't wanna keep you guys here all night. Um, so getting, uh, taking a step back and thinking about the role of mycids in food webs. My uh, food webs are my most, the sort of like the area of study that I'm most interested in. And mycids are really important in food webs. They're important as predators. They eat pretty much anything that they can catch and get in their mouth. Um, so they, um, and, and I, I will, uh, good question, Craig. I noticed you asked about what are the predators. I'm gonna show some slides on that in just a moment. Uh, mycids are also really important as prey. So we can see here, um, they're fed upon by birds, by fish, by other invertebrates. Um, and they're also important competitors with other um, animals such as larval fish during certain times of life. And so if we sort of step through this, you know, how do we study food webs and how do we understand the role of mycids? Well, a lot of this is based on diet studies. And so going out and looking in the stomachs of fish or um, other vertebrates, I've never done anything besides fish, but people do it with birds. They'll make them vomit or collect um, bird poop and look at sort of identify uh, structures within that. So a lot of what I'm talking to talk about is coming from diet data, as well as um, biomarkers such as lipid profiles or stable isotopes, um, which are sort of chemical markers we can use to trace um, who's eating who in different food webs. So what do mycids eat? We're gonna start with mycids as predators. Well, as I said, mycids are really opportunistic. They will, they're what we consider omnivores. So they'll eat um, at multiple sort of levels in a food chain. They'll eat detritus, which is sort of dead, decaying plant and animal matter. They'll eat algae, 
um, single cell phytoplankton floating in the water, so eating plants. They'll eat small animals, copepods, other rotifers, other types of zooplankton. They're also cannibalistic. When they can, they'll catch and eat each other. Um, so you have to be really careful when you're trying to raise mice, it's that you separate the juveniles from the adults, or else the adults would just eat all the juveniles. And this is just a plot from a study showing um, some diet items of mycids in the St. Lawrence River. And you can see um, Gesh Winkler, the lead author of the study, found both diatoms, so those micro, microalgae, as well as pollen from terrestrial plants being uh, ingested by these mycids. So they really will eat anything. And what's really interesting, something I'm very interested in, is I'm going back to this slide showing the mice that's moving up in the water column at night and then back down during the day. And when they do this, when they're up in the water column, they're feeding a lot on the, the phytoplankton, the algae, they're eating the copepods. So they're feeding up in a food web near the surface. And then they're moving down and they're eating the detritus and the mud and organic matter at the bottom. So they're eating on the bottom food web. And they're serving as this biological pump to move um, or move matter between these different food webs. So they're really important in what we call coupling different ecosystems. So again, we're going back to this uh, case study where we're looking at the Patuxent versus the Chop Tank River. And now, you know, remember the Chop Tank is, has lots of oxygen near the bottom. The Patuxent River does not in some areas. And so the question now is, you know, we saw not much of a difference in terms of abundance or growth rates, but what about their role in the food web? Does that change uh, between these two tributaries? Uh, oops, I went the wrong way. There we go. No, keep going the wrong way. There we go. Um, and it turns out it does matter. So these are, um, these are plots that show sort of the proportion of the diet of mycids from these two different river systems from different months and different years. And what we find is that mycids in the chop tank are eating a lot more of that nice, good, rich organic matter on the bottom. So all that detritus, the mycids are able to go down and eat it in the chop tank river, presumably because there's lots of oxygen so they can get down there and they can access that food source. In the Patuxent River, the mycids are eating much more of their diet is coming from up in the water column. They're eating the phytoplankton and the copepods, but they're not eating much of that bottom organic matter. So it looks like, you know, that poor water quality that um, that sort of is a, is an, an effect of over um, too much nutrients or too much fertilizer getting into the estuary uh, or eutrophication. What that's doing is it's decoupling these two sort of food webs and making it so that the mycids can't perform their ecological role um, in these more sort of degraded estuaries. And now I'm getting into um, what eats mycids. And this is, I have a few slides here, then this will sort of wrap up my talk. But mycids are super important as prey. I like to think of them as the chicken nugget of the estuary, right? Everything eats mycids, everything loves mycids especially the juveniles of lots of different types of fish. So if we look at this sort of simplified version of the Chesapeake Bay food web, um, you can sort of identify this group zooplankton. This is where the mycids would fall because mycids aren't identified here in this particular food web. But if we included mycids here and then we connected them to each of the different organisms in this food web or groups that ate mycids, this is what it would look like. Everything eats mycids. And so they're really important uh, in terms of linking lots of different types of the food web together. And so let's just step through a few examples. You know, who eats mycids? Well, striped bass, uh, locally known as rockfish. Rockfish eat a lot of mycids. So this is some work done by uh, Walt Boynton. He's an ecologist here at Chesapeake Biological Lab. This is work that he published back in the uh, uh, in 1980. And so this is just a simple food web, but it shows age zero juvenile my, uh, striped bass that were sort of born this particular year. And the thickness of these lines represent the importance of these different prey items. And so mycids 
nice thick line connecting mycids to the striped bass. They're really important in terms of the diet of um, these young striped bass, less than say 12 inches long. But even the bigger striped bass, so this is diet data from the main stem of Chesapeake Bay for two-year-old striped bass. So now we're talking about fish that are anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half long. So they're quite a bit bigger. And they're eating these animals that are maybe the length of your, uh, they're as long as your fingernail is wide. But if you look at the thickness of this line connecting mycids to these striped bass, you can see they're a really important source of prey for these larger striped bass. You know, these fish are also eating spot, menhaden, other fish prey, but they're still relying on mycids as a big chunk of their diet. And we see the same thing when we look across lots of different types of fish. So whether we're looking at harvested fish that have dedicated fisheries, things like different species of flounder, American shad, weak fish, uh, black sea bass, croaker, bluefish, all of these animals, this shows the percent of, my, the percent of mycids as uh, sort of biomass in the stomachs of these fish. You know, it ranges from about 80, more than 80% of the diet for windowpane flounder down to, you know, 5, 10% for things like bluefish or scuff. Uh, when we look at non harvested species, species that maybe we don't catch them and eat them, but are important for how the ecosystem functions, things like you know, uh, stingrays, sea robins, um, other smaller fish. Uh, again, mycids are a very large, if not dominant component of the diet. And then if we follow two of these harvested species, weak fish here in blue, summer flounder in red, and we look down here, we can break it out by, are we looking at small weak fish or medium sized or large weak fish? Same with summer flounder. What we see is that mycids are really important in that juvenile period for both of these uh, species. And so mycids really are the glue that's fueling, or I was about to say glue that's holding these uh, food groups together. Uh, and I got that mixed up with the food that's fueling them, but you get my point. I mean, these mycids are really important, especially at that young juvenile life stage. Um, and then my, this is my final sort of Data slide. This again is drawn from my PhD work off the coast of Maryland, off Assateague. Um, and it was really interesting. We, I used some uh, stable isotope biomarkers. And when I looked at the tissue composition of these fish that live way up in the water near the surface and they're eating plankton, their tissue sort of chemical signature was very similar to that of these like different flounders that live on the bottom. Um, you know, these hake or these cusk eels, you know, these very different groups of fish had a very similar chemical signature. And it's because they were all eating mycids. These mycids were sort of traveling between these two food webs and everything was eating them. And because of that, it was really linking these very different sort of groups of fish together into the same sort of functional food web. Oops. I, think I need to replace my mouse. So this is my wrap up slide. Um, you know, there's lots of ongoing work in my lab on mycids. And really this all boils down to the fact that there's very little historical observations of mycids in our ecosystem. And we really need to understand mycids in order to understand how the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem functions um, from a food web perspective at least. And so some of the ongoing work in my lab includes looking at population dynamics of mycids, trying to understand how the different populations are connected um, genetically in the different parts of the bay, doing some modeling of the habitat to understand how different habitat conditions actually affect which mycids are there and how many tend to occur there. Um, looking at things like prey preference and grazing rates and trying to include those into a big model where we can try to predict what mycids are gonna eat. And then finally, hopefully using some new sort of cutting edge genetic approaches to look in the stomach contents of mycids and really try to understand what they're eating and when. So that is the end of my talk. I'm gonna just leave this slide up there to thank everybody and all the funding, uh, the folks who have funded me and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Ryan, this was fascinating. Um, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to go back. One was Dal, and then you, you kind of go because uh, mice are so important to so many fish. Um, 
he asked, are they good to grow for fish farms? Would that be a good source of food? That's, you know, that's a good question. I don't know in terms of the, um, the economics of growing mycids versus something else. I honestly don't know if they're, um, if they're the sort of the, you know, the best fiscal choice, but I will say that people who have um, keep aquaria and have fish that really rely on, um, that need to eat live prey, very often they'll grow mycids to feed to those fish because they're a really good food for those picky sort of aquarium eating uh, fishes. Um, and before we get into the invasive part, um, because we have a couple of questions on that, Judy wanted to know what the purpose of the telson is in, in the male mycid. The purpose of the telson in the male mycid. Um, so the telson, you know, I haven't looked that much into the sort of the functional morphology of these animals. So I would suspect that for both sexes, the telson is important uh, in terms of a sort of a stabilizing and swimming appendage. Um, you know, the male similar to the female, I, I'm guessing the structure is the same. Um, I did, I had mentioned maybe not super clearly that the male um, Neomyces americana has longer sort of pleopods than the female does. And that is, those are used during mating. And so that helps um, almost like a, a grasping mechanism. Um, but I think this, the, the telson has the same function for both, both sexes. And then, um, so we had a couple of questions um, about the invasives. How, do, how would the invasive uh, mice get to a new location? Do we know? And then um, how did they cause the decline at the Flathead Lake in Montana that you showed? Sure. So unfortunately, mice can travel lots of different ways. Um, you know, uh, here in an estuary like Chesapeake Bay, mycids and other estuaries around the world, mycids have been transported via ballast water in ships. And so that's how mycids have been sort of distributed around the world. Um, Neomyces americana has popped up recently down in Brazil. Um, and some of the rivers down there, we think it came from North America and it came via ballast water. Um, same with lots of other species of mycid uh, throughout Europe. So that's one mechanism. Another is um, live wells in boats and other mechanisms. People will fill them up in one lake, go to a different lake, um, and then release the water. And all of a sudden, everything that was in that water gets into the new lake. Um, and so, you know, I, I suppose there's probably instances where they've been released sort of accidentally. Um, maybe somebody had an aquarium and they just took and dumped it out, or you know, I can't imagine anybody purposefully stocking mycids, but it's, it may have happened. But yeah, I think mostly sort of like uh, sh movement via ship, sort of unintentional movements. Um, it's probably, or via small per uh, personal watercraft boats is probably the two biggest ways. And then how did it cause the decline? Sure. So um, I won the slides. I showed that mycids will really eat anything, right? You know, they'll eat algae, they'll eat copepods, they'll eat everything. But, you know, mycids often, individual types of mycids will have a preferred prey. And so when they can get a certain prey, they'll eat it. Um, in the Flathead Lake example, there was uh, a certain size class of zooplankton, of a copepod, so a small crustacean in the water that the mycids really just liked to eat. And so they started to graze down that food and that sort of took away that food resource for the salmon, um, which as juveniles, I think, fed on that same sort of um, um, uh, copepod. And so what it did was it basically, they outcompeted these native fish species for a prey. And the result was these sort of this, this what we call a trophic cascade, where if you affect one level of the food web, it affects something else, that affects something else. And ultimately, the entire sort of um, fish community changed and that led to changes in um, the availability of fish for predators like the bald eagles. And uh, it's like the butterfly effect, but in the, in the, in the food web. That's true. That's very true. 
So Lynn, Lynn asks a question, and I'm not really sure um, the question, but it says, did the different species variation and the seasonal change uh, through the year change the result of sail? Was it? I guess it was it a, a result of sailing concentration um, as part of the the seasonal change. Sure. Yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, I don't think it was due to salinity, and the reason I don't think that is because. I have data that I, I didn't show, but it's from a his, uh, historically Chesapeake Bay had a plankton monitoring survey where they would go out and they would sample um, different stations and they would do it, um, I think it was bi-weekly or maybe monthly. Uh, and that ran from 1984 through 2002. And that survey was not great at catching mice, but it still did catch mice. And so I've looked at those data in the past and what it shows starting in the spring is an upstream movement of mycids at the fresher and fresher stations. And that occurred independent of salinity changes. So it really looks like it's linked to either temperature, possibly um, productivity. So as, as you know, we get closer into spring and into the summer, um, sort of like the peak areas of food would change for the mycids. And so that could sort of like initiate that migration or it could be linked to, um, to changes in daylight. So lots of species will sort of initiate migration based on the length, length of the day. And so it could be linked to that. And um, I have a, just a couple questions. One is, um, they're big, they're, they're, they're large enough for us to see, and we saw that in, in your, in your thing. So could, could, we go out and collect and drag a net and find some mice if we were out on out in the out and about in the water and um, could we pick some up and take a look at them? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, we often you know we'll go out in a small boat and catch them at night if we need some for an analysis or we need to put some in a tank to run some experiments. We even have a pier down here at CBL at the mouth of the Patuxent River, and at night you can drag a net. Through the water, um, right there in fairly shallow water, I mean, you know, three or four feet deep, and you can catch them. So they're definitely around. If you have a light on your pier, you're probably not going to catch them. They, um, you know, they're very photosensitive, so they don't like light, and um, but they're really abundant when they're there. So um, odds are good you can catch them. And then the other part was with the uh, plankton scope. Have you considered um, uh, initiating a community science or citizen science program where you could have folks, um, you know, kind of go through some of the data, the photographs, and and do some of that uh, that labor? That's a really interesting question. Um, I hadn't thought of that. Um, no, it's it's a great idea. I know that we're looking for. So it would be a lot of data for, um, for those poor folks, folks to pour through, but it would be really interesting to see what they found. I know that you know, folks have volunteered, students have volunteered in my lab and did some amazing work. Um, lots of the, all the, the length data that we calculated the growth rates from is based on basically volunteers. Volunteering in my lab and just measuring the length of mycids um, on images taken from microscopes. So, that might be a great idea. It might be one worth exploring, certainly. Yeah, Rob, it reminded me of some of the space um, ones that they take pictures of the sky and you're going up there and looking for different planets and things like that. And they even get, you know, high school students involved in, 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 in doing it so they could, you know, I love do it that a couple idea. of hours and cover, get a couple hours and you can get some data. That's right. Yeah, it's like community service for the high schoolers. I think they all have to do that, right? Yes, they do. That's a great idea. Um, great. So let us know if you want to help out with that, because I think that would be kind of fun. Um, it's kind of like a, a hunt for a, a cool kind of scavenger hunt, looking for looking for mice and how important they are. So thank you so much. Um, you were really shedding a light on this uh, part, very, very important part of our Chesapeake Bay, um, of our aquatic um, ecosystems that even go into our terrestrial um, zones as well. 
So we have more appreciation that for uh, even the, the, the smallest uh, among us plays such a important, an important role. So. Great. Well, thank you for having me and thanks everybody for listening to it. I, I do appreciate that. I noticed that Derek had a suggestion. So I'm going to see if I can maybe use common names a bit more. And that's tough. Maybe we need to have some crowdsourced common names. A lot of these guys don't have common names, unfortunately, but maybe, maybe we could start a trend. But that's, that's a good idea. Maybe wherever I can, I'll, I'll try to do that. It's a good suggestion. And I hope that we'll see everybody next Thursday um, who are learning about COVID in the wild, COVID in our wild animal populations, thanks to us. Um, and then the catfish of Maryland to finish off. And don't forget about Shark Fest. Come and learn all about shark with us uh, at the end of June. And everybody stay well, stay curious, um, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.